So who all's new? Okay. You guys missed out on the bonobos. I'm sorry. If you want to know what we did in first class, look at the syllabus and look up bonobos and chimps and the difference. But I'm not going to talk about it in class ever again. I'm sorry. Um, so we had this uh, 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 CTKs. Who didn't finish their CTK? And then the new people, presumably. Okay, so what we're going to do with this is um, uh, because uh, uh, we have we have a substantial, a statistically significant new population of students, the uh, um, the the CTK. If you haven't turned it in yet, turn it in by Friday, 11:59 p.m. If after today's discussion, or if you just think that if you just know that you did a total crap job on it and you want to you want to uh, um, uh, redo it. Uh, you have till Friday to turn in, and I, I won't grade them until Saturday, so you can so you can you can do better. It, it will say that it's past due, but you should still be able to to, to uh, put it in the Dropbox and delete your old one because I get confused. I mentioned I get I'm a little I'm a little batty. I'm I'm getting old, and you this doesn't. I don't have the robust intellectual firepower that you guys do. I get confused easily. Yes, ma'am. No. Just one. You just have to do one. You pick, you pick, you pick one and do it. Oh. So anytime there's a CTK due, that means that. Uh, um, so to to be absolutely crystal clear about this, well, I'm not absolutely crystal clear. I mentioned it in passing in class, and it wasn't on the assignment. So what you'll do when you have a CTK due is all of the readings that aren't. Okay, that was bad cognitive science. All the readings from uh, D2L that you've done since the last CTK, you choose which one you like the best and you write the CTK on that. What you cannot write a CTK on is uh, um, like the, the uh, readings from Writing Public Lives or Student's Guide. Did anybody do a CTK on Writing Public Lives or Student's Guide? Okay, because man, that would have been... Not that there's anything wrong with CTK or <laughs> Writing Public Lives or Student's Guide. Um, so uh, we'll we'll start with the uh, with with a quick discussion of the writing public lives and students guide because that's what the uh, that's what our assignment in the class is about, right? Okay, so it's so we, we're doing this rhetorical analysis. Now remember, everything's working toward this rhetorical analysis that we've got due coming up. I think like next week we have to basically start on getting our thesis for it and stuff. It's just it's the thing about about only having one day of class for the first two weeks of school. So um. Rhetorical situation. This is important, right? Because we're doing a class on, on, on rhetoric. So, uh, um, what is a rhetorical situation? I think it was in one of the books. I read it. Pull our books out. Absolutely. I like books. Um, speaker, message, purpose, context, and Okay, right from the book. Can you say that one more time that we've got a little more, less, less, less bustle? I actually already forgot. Okay. <laughs> Author, speaker, message, purpose, context, and audience. Okay, so we've got, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a, Door number one is a goat. I still can't get my head around that door number two thing about switching your choices after they do it. It increases your, doubles your chance to pick the right door. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so we've got uh, speaker, audience. No, wait, that's wrong. Speaker, author, right? Author, speaker, yeah. Author, speaker, okay. Okay, so that's one. And what was the other one? Message, purpose. <coughs> Message, purpose. Context. Context. Audience. Okay. So this is important because because uh, um, 
this is you know part of your rhetorical analysis is what you're going to have to do is determine the uh, the author speaker the message purpose and the context audience of uh, whatever it is that you uh, happen to be rhetorically analyzing. Okay. So what's an author speaker? The person that's writing or like telling the story or whatever is happening. Right. Very good. And the message? What they're trying to convey. One might say the message. <laughs> New England. Yay, deflate gate. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I just saw New England. You know, I don't know if, if you guys heard New England's in trouble because they deflated a bunch of balls during a game, which is fun to say. Context audience. <laughs> what is a context audience? Like who the message is going to. So, um, this does seem like it's, uh, so we've got, so a rhetorical situation is any time when somebody's talking to somebody else, right? So you've got somebody talking, you've got what they're saying, and you've got the person that's listening. Okay, I'm glad that it's is that clear. So like, what's the what's the rhetorical situation right now? Yeah. So who's the speaker? You are. What's my what's my message? That we understand what you're saying. Kind of. We'll have to work on that, but yeah, the gist is there. And and uh, I'll, who's my audience? Well, okay, I think we got that. All right, everybody got this. Okay, I'm gonna erase it. So if you need to write it down, <laughs> it's also in your book. Okay. And then there's another, there's another like triangle of stuff, right? Maybe it was in the other book. So there's the ethos, the pathos, and the logos, right? The different kinds of appeals. Does anybody remember anything about that? I really, I can't remember anything. So what was the, what was the logos? Yeah. Yeah. So, um. An excellent example of a logos is an appeal. Is this morning, my four-year-old dumped her bowl of Cheerios on my dog, <laughs> and I said, "Oh my dear four-year-old, what a dear you are, my little lily of my life, as I call her. Why, pray tell, did you dump a bowl of Cheerios on the dog?" Watching the wheels spin. She said I was stupid. <laughs> Logic. The dog called her stupid. The dog deserved to get Cheerios dumped on. The dog didn't care. The dog was like, score Cheerios, right? So, uh, I have a, uh, um, so that's a logical argument, right? These are the appeals. Logos. Okay. And then there's a, 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 um, a pathos or pathos, depending on depending on who's pronouncing it. Oh, all right. That's what's what's pathos. Emotional, emotional appeal. So can uh, uh, somebody give me an example of an emotional appeal? Just like something that happened in their life, an anecdote. Or a commercial or something that makes a very powerful emotional appeal. And you're like, you know, that's an emotional appeal. Oh, yeah. So, like, Nike, like, just do it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not logical. Yeah? A Budweiser commercial where they have, like, a little puppy and then they're growing up with the person and they end up in a car accident. The puppy's like, oh, no, where's my owner? Where's the little guy? Oh, yeah. I've never seen that commercial, but I'm it's devastated. Sad. It's very sad. Like, I'm this guy never comes. You know what? That's it. I'm not drinking and driving anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything with puppies. Puppies are, 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 are the... Uh, uh, they're the, the doomsday machine of emotional appeal, right? 
Puppies will get you. Yeah. That's why you got to look out for them. Okay. Um, and then there's another one. What is it? Huh? You said ethos or something. Yeah. E e ethos, I think. So what's ethos? Hmm? Yeah, it's the thing that everybody, it's, because it's a trick, because you think ethics, right? But it's, it's got, no, it's, 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 no, it's not. I, I think that we should go back, we should go back, and grab Aristotle by the ear, and say, call ethos something else, because everybody gets it confused with ethics. Because it's not, it's the, but it's the, it's the, I've been yammering at Aristotle for a good 13 years now, and the old kook just, it's like he's not even there. So that, that, that's, that's, that's not it. That's what everybody thinks it is. And when this class is over and somebody asks you, that's what you'll say it is. And if somebody shakes me up in the middle of the night and says, what is ethos? I'm like, I don't know, like morals. But, but it's not. What is it? It's an appeal to authority or authenticity. Like, why should you be listening to this guy? <coughs> right? So, like, uh, um, say you're joining a gang. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this a lot today because I'm just, for some reason, I've got gangs on the brain. And, uh, uh, and you want some advice, right? So you know who I'm going to talk to? Crumbo. <laughs> because, uh, uh, and so I will, uh, uh, I will tell you about uh, um, what you need to do to, uh, uh, and you, you, and your, you and your homies will come, and I will talk to you about the ins and outs of being a successful gang member. So should I be listened to? Would you listen to me? No. Because I don't have any, I don't have any crap, right? I, I, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know about being in a gang. Don't listen to me, I've got no authority, right? So, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, but, you know, like, uh, 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 if you could, if you could go find out where Tupac's hiding and talk to him, right? Well, he wasn't in a gang, he was a classically trained actor, but you get my point, right? So there's, there's, you'd still, even though that Tupac wasn't in a gang, although he did shoot two off-duty police officers. So that's pretty cool. And he got shot in the genitals, which is also pretty cool. Not as cool. But, um, but you know, like, you'd listen to Tupac before you'd listen to me, right? Or, or, or better, better yet, the Godfather, Marlon Brando, right? That's, that, you know, like, Wait, he's an actor too. I'm getting all confused, but you get the point, right? Okay. <laughs> Ethos. Not morals. Credibility. Okay. That's all I want to talk about from the reading, from the, the textbook readings for today. We'll do, we'll do more stuff, especially when we start going over the assignment, which I think we do next week. Okay. So in the interest of transparency, you know, like I, I think it's good to, uh, uh, in a class where you're teaching, that everything's a rhetorical situation and I want you to look at everything as an argument and everything as a specific situation and, and, and just sort of dislodge. Uh, um, the first thing I want us to look at is, is uh, uh, the, the, the load of, of garbage that I'm scooping off to you. So uh, uh, I gave you three readings, right? And, uh, um, and, and each of them are, are designed to sort of my, my approach to the class, and what I'm trying to get across. Now, the, the, thing, the, the central thing that you'll be working on is the text that you work with, right? So when you do your controversy analysis, you will be choosing. You know, I might nudge you towards something or other, but ultimately you'll be deciding. But, you know, like, I've got to do something, so I've got a class that's running on, and, 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 and I have to give you readings, and, and so this is a rhetorical situation, and you should be analyzing stuff. You should be analyzing everything, because they're all out to get you. Okay? So, uh, um, 
I'm uh, teetering precariously close to becoming a doctor of philosophy. All I have to do is drop my dissertation. I'll be a doctor of philosophy. Should I call? Should I make people call me doctor? How about just jerks, you know? Like, hey, uh, Mr. Crumbo, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> like a dentist. I know a dentist that makes me. Like, just not even like as a patient. Like, he introduces himself as Dr. X. Like, like, dentist. I mean, nothing wrong with being a dentist. I mean, that, it's, it's like teeth. Have, have you ever, anybody gone through life with no teeth? Hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Um, so, uh, but I'm, so, so I'm, into, I'm into this sort of philosophical approach. And so when you're looking at somebody's argument, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you've you got you to gotta kind of look at it philosophically. At least you do if you're a doctor of philosophy. And uh, um, has anyone taken any philosophy classes? Oh, fabulous. So, uh, um, so hopefully, I don't know what they're teaching in the philosophy department these days. Somebody knows, like, the three major branches of philosophy uh, so far as the... Uh, 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 I guess topics. Uh, um. Well, the first, I'll get it rolling. Ontology. Okay, so we've got a lot of people that have taken. Anybody know what ontology is? They ought to teach this in philosophy class. Not to judge, big brother. So ontology is uh, uh, um, the study of, uh, of, of what is being, you know, like what's really there. So like, uh, um, what's really here? What's really here? Yeah, yeah what's really here? You. Yeah. But what am I? A person. What is a person? I don't know. Cells. Good. Cells. What are cells? Atoms. What are atoms? Matter. What's matter? Everything. Hmm? You say entropy? No, everything. Everything. Matters. I'll tell you what I am. I'm a cloud of subatomic particles that has, and each of those has a probability that is here at this given place in this given time, but it's really just a cloud. So all there is is there's these quanta and empty space. That's what it is. But that's not, do you see quanta and empty space? No. No. So, so, uh, uh, but what's really there, so, so ontology is what's really there, what's really going on, what's, what's, you know, like, what do I think I'm dealing with, you know, what is reality, right? Okay, there's another branch of, 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 of uh, philosophy. Theology? Theology is not technically philosophy, we'll get to that, sort of, but there's, there's a, uh, I, I'll tell you, it's called epistemology. This one's a little bit harder to spell. Does anybody know what epistemology is? It's how we know. So, it's not no longer about what is, but like, how do we know what is? You know, what are we what are we basing this on? You know, like so. Uh, um, so if I'm a good if I'm a good physicist, and I know that what's really there is just a bunch of uh, uh, electron clouds and empty space. And I'm like, well, but it comes through my senses, right? And like I don't see I, my my eyes aren't fine enough to see electron clouds. I just kind of see their macroscopic results. What what uh, this gentleman is called? What was your name? Yeah. yeah. Cameron. Cameron, what Cameron calls people, right? I just wanted to do that because. <laughs> so, uh, um, so uh, how do we know that? Well, how do we know it's a person? Looks like a person, sounds like a person. So you know, you, you get your sense, and that's really not a good example. So I'm just going to keep moving. Okay, third branch. You guys know this one. It's what you thought ethos was. Big branch of philosophy. Hmm. Yeah, or what's another word? Close to ethos. Hmm? Ethics. ethics. Okay. And ethics is, what is ethics? Right from wrong. Right from wrong. Supposedly right from wrong. Yeah, so, so what I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, quote the great epistemologist that I can't stand, Immanuel Kant. What? Ah, 
me to do. Because I do like the, 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 the turn of the phrase of the translation. What ought we to do? So, um, so every, every argument makes ontological assumptions, epistemological assumptions, and, and ethical assumptions. Right? The arguments usually, most arguments that we encounter in life have to do with ethics. But every ethics has an ontological and epistemological under. For example, the, uh, uh, the gentleman that rants and raves out on the mall. You may have heard him. You may have been uh, 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 prophesized that you yourself will be damned to all eternity because your dress shows a little too much ankle. Oh! Says modesty. So, and as likely as not, this gentleman may have come at you, quoting scripture, proving that you are in fact going to be <coughs> damned for all eternity. And this is all in the service of an ethical thing, right? Put on some clothes because you are arousing the lust demons of sin all around you. Woman sin and adultery! Sorry, I get caught up sometimes. And woman sin is a great word. Okay, so what is his ontological assumption? We'll start at the bottom. What is, what is, what is really there? Is he concerned about electrons and, outer, and, and, and empty space? No. What is... What is reality? It's the word. The word made flesh. This is, this is a sort of a petri dish of gods, right? It's, so you have God and you have his creation, right? That's the ontological assumption. That's what's there, right? And it could be electron clouds. I don't care. It's the word made flesh, right? Okay, so that ontological assumption carries a lot with it, right? Because if you don't accept that ontological assumption, everything on top of that is going to be, going to be kind of a head-scratcher to you, right? You're like, I don't know. You know, like, say you're a, a hunter-gatherer in Papua New Guinea, and all you've ever done is, is, is uh, uh, um, eaten the brains of your, of your neighbors and pounded roots all day, right? And you're like, what the? All right, it's not going to make sense. So his epistemology. So according according to him, what is our what is his epistemological? What's, how do we know? How do we know that what is is the word made flesh through divine revelation? How do we know this? The Holy Scriptures, the Word made word, right? So that's why. You know, like, uh, 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 if, if, if you share the ontological assumptions and you share the epistemological assumptions, there is a powerful weight, at least in theory, to quoting scripture, right? To make an ethical point. Now, who has been successfully converted by uh, uh, some crazy guy yelling on the mall? How often do you think this works? I like I don't I don't actually gamble because I'm a family man and I'm poor and I can't actually gamble, but I have the spirit of a gambler. What's the over under on on a, a, a um, brother? What's his name? Brother Ted Dean. Dean. Yeah. How many people do you? How many souls do you think that he saved? None. There's got to be some. Maybe one. <laughs> All right. Who says under 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 five? Who says over a hundred? Well, I know it's at least one. I mean, stand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So no, that's not. And 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 it's not entirely fair to uh, uh, to, to 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 take this this. Uh, Brother Dean was at it. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely fair to make uh, uh, Brother Dean, but that's just. That's his argument. That doesn't mean that his ontological assumption is wrong. It doesn't mean that his epistemological <laughs> assumption is wrong. It doesn't mean that his ethics are wrong. 
I mean, it may well be, but but that doesn't mean that that just that's just the rhetorical situation, right? That's what he's that's what he's putting forth. So uh, um, another crackpot that goes around ranting, ranting and raving on campus is yours truly, and I'm teaching a composition class, and and uh, I too am am am, am putting forth a. Uh, an ontological, epistemological, and ethical uh, uh, pie that I'm serving to you, and you can take it or leave it. Well, you, can, you have to take it. You can you can ignore it. You can you can you can deconstruct it. You can you can uh, um, put it in the pantry. Who has a pantry? I always wanted a pantry. I don't have a pantry. I'm jealous of you. And uh, um, and I got I got three different works that I made you read. And one speaks to the ontological assumption that I'm bringing forth in my class. And uh, can anybody guess what that is? The pinker reader. The pinker reader, right. So, uh, um, so what's, the, uh, uh, what's the ontological assumption of the pinker reading? Just, just quiet, just think, think for 15 seconds. What's the ontological assumption of the pinker reading? I'll tell you that human nature exists, that there is something called human nature. Okay. It's not quite as strong of an ontological assumption, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's one nonetheless. <coughs> and that, 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 that you and I Person. <laughs> person. I never felt more professorial than saying person <laughs> is a, a mixture of uh, inherited traits, epigenetic manifestations, and environmental considerations. Epigenetics is in between. We'll talk more about epigenetics later, or not. So that's the, that's the ontological claim. So the, epistemo my, the, my, the epistemological, how do we know? How do we know? <coughs> so what do you think my, my epistemological text is? Out of, out of the three. So we had the pinker, the mistakes were made, and the nudge. So Pinker was the ontology. Pinker. People really don't like Pinker, by the way. I like him. The person I work with in the neuroscience lab. That's okay. Because she's allowed to be wrong. Oh yes, I've contemplated that paradox. <laughs> All right, mistakes were made, and the the uh, uh, the assumption is that uh, um, the epistemological assumption is that you've got this way of looking at <coughs> things that we do. That's sort of and it's the the well, it's the scientific method. There's this way to kind of step outside and look at the things that people do, even while you're doing it, because basically you're seeing other people do it. <coughs> and so uh, and then and then. We'll, we'll, we'll go through that a little bit of, of, of that. And then, and then we've got, of course, the ethics. So we had three texts. One was the Pinker. One was the, the, the Tavris and whatever that her, her co-author's name is. I forget. And then we had the Nudge. So what is the ethics text? Make me scream out when sin and adultery in my in my preaching my voice again. I'll do it. Hmm? What is it? Nudge. Nudge. Okay. What's the argument of nudge? Who did their CTK on nudge? Wow, that was the easiest one. Who did it on Pinker? Because it was the shortest one. Who did it on the uh, the the, uh, the other one? Okay. So I'm on my own with the nudge. Okay, that's all right. I can carry the nudge weight. <coughs> um, so 
So uh, the nudge was about, it kind of takes these, these two things for granted. The nudge is that we can be manipulated in ways that we don't know. Subconscious, you might call it. And, and, and we're always, every, every decision that we make that affects other people, we're, we're nudging them one way or the other. And knowing this, knowing that we can control these, these uh, automata <coughs> that are people that don't know what they're doing, they're just blundering through life and trying to avoid cognitive dissonance and obeying their heuristics and biases. We know that we can manipulate them and we can get them to eat carrots or french fries. <coughs> what ought we to do? Right? That's the question that they're asking. So anybody remember what their, what their solution was? What we should do with this knowledge that we can make people do whatever we want? Should we... Anybody? What do you think we should do? What? Pretend like, <coughs> pretend like you can make me do whatever you wanted me to do. Now? Hmm? Right okay. now? Yeah. We're not in class right now. <laughs> Self-interest. So you self-interest should be the guiding principle in manipulating other people. See why that's an ethical problem, though? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. like, in yeah. the case of the school thing, it's like a cafeteria. If you're going to maximize profit, then, like, obviously everyone's going to be a fat ass. <coughs> right. But, <laughs> but profit's good, right? Yeah, because, I mean, the, the asparagus lobby's got nothing compared on the French fry lobby. Trust me, I know. So yeah, so that's a that's a it's we'll use the, we'll use the text. So so his the the thing that 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 that, uh, that Taylor and Sunstein put forward is that you're designing a cafeteria, and you know that whatever you put on eye level right here, will will be the primary thing that the kids go for, and you have to make this. I see that everyone read this very carefully, and um, so if you put vegetables there, they get vegetables, mostly they'll get other stuff too. But it's their brain focuses <coughs> the main thing. If you put pot roast there, they get pot roast. French fries, jello, that's what they'll get, right? So and you know this. <coughs> so whatever you put there, they're going to take lots of. So this, is a, this, this, this presents a, conund a conundrum to you. So what if, uh, uh, um, what if you, make, you get kickbacks from the French fry people if they eat a crap load of French fries? They're going to promote French fries. Yeah. But is that ethical? Yeah. Why not? Do. Why? Are French fries good for you? No, they're like bad. Yeah. We get to the, the fat ass hypothesis. Right. <laughs> so, um, so maximizing profits, not necessarily, not necessarily the best thing to do, right? So, um, but I mean, you're you're sort of playing. You're you're playing. I'm not going to say playing God, but you're playing something here. And you know, like, should you really like? Who are you to tell the kids that they should be eating vegetables, right? So maybe a, that this was another thing, just random. Just, just uh, you put you, you put it into a ping pong ball dispenser, and whatever ping pong ball comes out, if it's fries, you know, like pot roast, just just pepperoni, not even pizza, just pepperoni, or better yet, pepperoni with melted cheese in a soup. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds good. I must be getting hungry. <laughs> cheese stew. Okay. So uh, um, so that would be like. But you can't really do that, right? Because that's stupid, right? Or is it? Or is it not? Is it stupid just to randomize it, or is that the right thing to do? If, I don't know. If you can back it, then I feel like it's <coughs> because if you say, if you're giving a random, you know the outcome that will happen if you use French fries. You know the outcome if you use vegetables. So if it's random, you can just like have a half hypothesis with that. Yeah, and it'll all come out just being it'll all average out. Yeah. Would you rather your kids eat the vegetables or the or the, uh, or the cheese stew? I feel like if they have enough vegetables, then they can have it. Okay. As long as they're working. But just primarily, I mean, you can still get no. Everything's there, right? Yeah. Well, that or not, right? You just take away the cheese stew. So they're 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 ethical. I mean, I got I got I got to get moving here because we're running out of we're running out of time. No, we're not. We still have a long time. Please. <laughs> I was just gonna say, like, you know how the, in the NBA, like the worst the, the, the worst. The team with like the worst record doesn't always get the number one pick because it's like a lottery, you know. But in the NFL, they do the worst record gets the number one pick. So like the NBA doesn't really like what all they do is you give the worst team the number one pick. Don't you? Don't you know what I mean? So this 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 is this would be an interesting thing for your controversy analysis. NBA draft reform. Yeah. It's uh. But then you get like the Sixers tanking, right? Right. Mm -hmm. 
which is horrible because every time they're on, it ruins the game. Natalie just rolled her eyes. I can't talk about sports. It was my second sports thing because I already talked about the deflating the balls. As <laughs> you know, in the NFL, you only play with your own balls during the game. So if you, hmm? yeah. So I don't know. <coughs> yeah. So anyway, the nudge thing, maybe we'll come back to it, maybe not. What they advocate is called libertarian paternalism. So libertarian paternalism is, can somebody, nobody did it, so it's on me because I'm the only one that did a CTK on it. All right, libertarian paternalism is the idea that, uh, um, that all the choices should be made available to you. If you want to choke on, on cheese, cheese and pepperoni stew and die of a heart attack when you're, when you're, when you're 17, you know, like, by all means. Don't let me stop you. But, knowing what I know, I think you're probably better off with the vegetables. So, insofar as I can manipulate your behavior by putting the vegetables here, because we've got a good scientific mind. This is, this is in your self-interest. Eat some vegetables, you, 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 know, you, 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 you fat butt, you. Right? And so, we're going to do that. But, you know, hey, take it or leave it. You know, like, if you want to put the thought into it and say, Man, I, didn't. I hate the system. Give me the cheese too. And you know, fine. So that's, that's, their, that's their, their ethics thing. And that's, that's, that's uh, I mean, none of this is necessarily exactly like, like what I think or something, but that's what I'm putting forth in the class. And so if you're analyzing this rhetorical situation, there's that. Okay. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the readings. First one I want to look at is Pinker because it's short. Short is good. Okay. Hands off. I get a little grabby with myself when the lights are out. Okay. Here's the cover of it. Steven Pinker, New York Times bestseller. The blank slate, the modern denial of human nature. Okay. So, um... Uh, what is the idea of the blank slate? been a popular one, no? I mean, sort of, right? Yeah. So, so, so Pinker argues. Um, why, why would such an idea be kind of appealing? Is it like, because a lot of people nowadays, they adopt or if you can have kids, and so like in a certain situation, the way you're growing up and like your culture that you're around is what you become. So if you take someone from this certain place and move them around, they're not going to act like where they're from. Mm -hmm. because they've evolved to this place. Okay. So, so good. So, like, so, uh, um, so uh, when we adopt kids, we want, we want them to kind of be ours, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, so, so there's, there's one reason. Can, uh, um, another reason why, why uh, it would be attractive to someone to think that, that we're just blank slates born into the world. You can manipulate Yeah, you can, you can, you can. Uh, um, so Pinker talks about this a little bit, right? So, the, um, so like, say... Pretend that I'm a Marxist revolutionary. All right, I know it's a stretch, and I want to usher in. I want to usher in a, a whole fundamentally different way of human relation. Right. So if I think that we're kind of inherently, you know, like disposed to uh, uh, not love uh, all of our brothers unconditionally, and that we're going to kind of uh, cheat and and be self-interested and stuff, 
then my whole communism idea is not going to work. I can't make everybody just naturally get along and just because because you know uh, I can't because you can't change you can't change human nature. So what I could do is either abandon my position as being a, 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 a communist revolutionary, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but chicks dig communist revolutionaries, and I am not entirely ready to give that up. Or I could say, no, there is no human nature. We are what we may. If we redesign society, we will corral everyone into being good communists, right? Seems like a good idea, right? I mean, the bonobo thing, right? Why not, right? But so, but but if we're actually chimps or chimpish, if you've got half bonobos and half chimps, the bonobo thing's not going to work that well, right? Okay. Sorry for those of you that weren't here for the bonobo thing, and I said I would never talk about bonobos again, but I did. That's okay. All right. So um. Uh. And but so so Pinker does he like the blank slate idea? No. no. And uh, um, why why does he think that it's not? Does he think that it's th does he think that there's no that that environment does not affect who we are and what we do? No. So can somebody tell me? And you somebody did a CTK on this one. Can somebody tell me what 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 uh, uh, Pinker's thesis is? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Or at least as, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. And uh, um Yeah. Does anyone disagree with that? That that's Pinker's thesis. You can disagree with the thesis. So um I want to look at it and then I want to do a little bit of a really really brief just general kind of like like, like let's look at let's look at how he how he uh, introduces this. Because I think that, the, 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 and he might be wrong, but I think he does an interesting thing to introduce the topic here. So, so uh, let's look at the rhetorical situation. All right, so um, what is the rhetorical situation? So we look at the, uh, um, what the uh, it was this up here. Um, author, speaker, who's the author or speaker? Yeah. What can we kind of, uh, what do we know about Pinker? Or what, what can we tell if, if we didn't look anything up? Or if we did look it. Can anybody tell me anything about Steven Pinker? Or just guess something from reading? He challenges an idea. Hmm? He challenges an idea. Okay. So he's, he's a, so as a personal characteristic, he's just sort of a, um, he's a kind of a contrarian. Okay. Did he use other people's like facts and details and show like how they tie into what he's saying or how they go against it? Okay. Like who is he? Like is he a um, is he an evangelical Christian? Is he a um, a, a, a former crack addict janitor uh, turned upstanding father? Maybe, but it's not relevant, right? So he's probably some sort of like intellectual type, right? Yeah. Um, uses uses big words, right? Uh, uh, Anybody that says uh, simplistic dichotomy between heredity and environment, like so, probably what eighth grade education, maybe college educated, college -ed. okay. So, uh, I mean, does he does he kind of seem like he knows what he's talking about? Yeah. Okay. So probably somebody that kind of knows what he's talking about. Whether you, I mean, you might be wrong, but you seem to know what he's talking about. Um, and the, the rhetorical situation is, is uh, uh, and I included the, uh, the cover for you. So what's the, what's the, uh, uh, what's the, the context and the, uh, and the audience? What form of argument is this, uh, uh, what, what, what form is this argument taking? Is, hmm? Oh, you're getting ahead of me a little bit. Um, there was audience and context, right? So, who's he trying to who's he trying to talk to? That's the people. So the temptation is to say a general audience. Yeah. But um. But we want to be more specific than that. 
because there's no such thing as a general audience. You might think that you, you know, like sometimes you might think that you're trying to talk to everybody, but you never are. So, um, evangelical Christians, gang members, um, specialists in the field. But we know that specialists in the field read specialist journals, right? And this is a this is a book. And not only is it a book, I know this as a person that's writing an academic book. There's a difference between what I'm doing and something that's going to actually sell, let alone be a New York Times bestseller, right? So we can look at this and think, okay, so this audience is not just going to be, because how many people actually like really specialize in studying the difference between nature and nurture, do you think? Yeah, maybe like 100. Not enough to not enough to float an uh, international bestseller, right? So we'll say college educated, uh, um, some leisure time, you know, like sort of armchair philosophers, you know, like they they're interested in ideas, but they're not necessarily on the cutting edge of of, of, of philosophy. They're not, you know, like it's not Aristotle or anything, but so you know, like uh, uh, and 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 it's a uh, uh, it's. He introduces it as an academic argument, but he also talks about how the idea has infiltrated popular culture and stuff. So he tries to relate it to, like, it, it, this isn't just an academic concern, right? I'm, I'm just going to start doing this all the time. <laughs> it's not an academic concern. You start doing everything. Okay. So uh, that's the rhetorical situation. So then we look at his strategy. So uh, um, what is his hook? Everyone take 15 seconds and read. Because we, we, we know we start off with, with a hook, right, in our introduction. Okay, so what, uh, what, what sort of, what does he do, what does he introduce it with? Right. So that's what that's what he gets to. But he starts off by by a, a, with a quote, right? Who's the quote by? His colleagues. His colleagues. But is it any particular person? And then he says it's just this is the the kind of reaction. So nobody actually said this, right? So this would be if we were if we were being really strict. This is that um, the the straw man fallacy, right? So uh, he's having somebody articulating the position that his book is a dumb idea and it's a waste of time, right? <coughs> like, oh, do this. Everybody knows this, right? And so, so that's an interesting way to, cause, you know, to, to try and grab you is, you know, like, so it's like you starting off with your paper, you know, with the, you know, like, people say that writing about, that writing about, uh, um, I don't know, what's something you wrote about in English 101? Um, flashback moment. Okay. Some people think that writing about flashback moments are really stupid, right? So that's your that's your that's your that's your reading, right? And then you're like, they point out that it's trite and blah 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 blah, and and so that's what he's doing here, right? So he's he's he's, he's set up a straw man arguing against his point, and uh and 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 this is this is this is kind of tricky because uh, um, and then he sort of agrees with the the straw man, and, you know, maybe nature versus nurture is a dead issue, like. So here, does anybody think that, 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 that it's all nature? That you're just, you're just hardwired? It's like, what if I told you this? Like, there is these twins that got separated at birth, proverbially, right? This is true. And they, uh, uh, um, and they both ended up with the same job. <coughs> both married to a uh, woman with the same name. Both drove the same car had the same problems with the car because their little, their little driving ticks were identical. Same, rooted for the same team even though they lived in different cities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that kind of creep you out? Yeah. Maybe a little. I just think, what if you have a, what if you have a, a, a separated twin that you don't know about and, and she's, just, she's doing the exact same thing except for instead of at U of A, she's at A of U. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so I mean, there's 
Probably not, but I mean, you could, you could, you could make a case. So anyway, but, but, uh, um, but no, I mean, that's kind of crazy, right? And then, uh, and nobody says that you're, we're just all, we're just all, you know, like, like products of our environment. I mean, really, you know, like if, if, uh, um, if, if Florence Griffith Joyner and, and, and Michael Jordan had a kid, you know, like that kid has a better chance of being an athlete than if, 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 uh, um, What's, what's uh, uh, Honey Boo Boo's mom? Oh, yeah. Yeah, if Mama June and I have a kid, you know, the, the, uh, that's not going to be as great of an athlete, right? <laughs> so nobody's that stupid. Nobody thinks that it's all, you know, genetic. So, I mean, we all think that, right? Okay. And then so, I mean, and this is, this is and then he gives these, 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 these very, you know, common sense. Yeah, of course. You know, like, like you know, genetic and environmental explanations are, you know, like in themselves are shortcoming. We got to look at balance. It's a combination of everything. And then, and he, and he gets you to agree with these, and and then, and then, I mean, he's being tricky because apparently this is this is evidence supporting the people that are saying that his book is stupid because, of course, everybody thinks this way, right? So he like lulls you to sleep, but then like, but then, but then, but then he reverses it and points out that these 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 books are from, or these quotes are taken from these like completely inflammatory books that people like totally freak out about and and protest, and and uh, I don't think there was actually a book burning, but. Um, but there's people that would have burned these books. The, uh, um, the bell curve. Did anyone know of the bell curve book? Ever, anybody heard of this? It's a pretty inflammatory book. And, uh, and, and people still get pissed about it. So what it was was that, uh, um, that, that, uh, that, that, that different, different uh, uh, races and ethnicities have different, different intellectual trajectories and it's partially based on heredity. So people freak out about that. Fair enough. The uh, uh, nurture assumption really, really hurt parents because parents are all like, as long as you do a perfect job with your kids, then you know, like you're gonna have perfect kids. But it like turns out that parents really don't have that much to do with how their kids turn out or not nearly as much as they thought. And people freak out about that. Because, well, what am I even trying to parent for? Why? Why? Why am I picking up Cheerios off of dogs? <laughs> it, it's a, uh, and then and then uh, my, my personal favorite, a natural history of rape, by Randy Thornhill and Craig Palmer. And what they do, theirs is is that's the one that I actually have to I have to uh, actually deal with some of this controversy in some of my work that I do. But um, they said that uh, uh, um, that 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 rape is a evolved strat mating strategy that has been adopted by, m by many animals and d different animals like scorpion flies, orangutans, and humans among them because more than 5% of living humans are the product of rape. So that means that it's a statistically significant reproductive strategy and, and, that, that it's a, uh, uh, and, and people freaked out about that, right? Because they're like, no, that means that you're, you're saying that like all men are, are genetically pre-programmed to be rapists. And, well, if you read the book, not really. It's not a great book, and they're wrong about a lot of stuff, and they're really not that smart. But they don't even deserve the amount of... of, of uh, but, that's, but that's the point, right? So the point is that if you come out with this so-called balanced views, then people think that you're, you're being a, a complete radical, right? And really, and, and if, if any of you are unfortunate enough to get stuck in academia for more beyond your just undergraduate career, and you're going to get a good heaping scoop of it, in your undergraduate career, is that uh, a lot of this uh, uh, um, nurture, blank slate uh, uh, thinking, particularly in the humanities and, and, and the social sciences, um, it's, it's there. Okay. But the, only, the point that I wanted to get was this rhetorical strategy on getting it out. That's kind of, it's kind of a good rhetorical strategy, right? I mean, if you did it, I would think that it was good. You'd get an A if you turned this in, right? Okay. Enough Pinker, I think. Let me make sure. Okay. Now I want to look at the mistakes we made because that's funner. <coughs> It'd be easier if it wasn't so hot. <coughs> We're almost there. We're almost there. Okay. I think that's funny. 
It's because it's, he painted himself into a corner as a, uh, as a, as a cliche. But, um, okay, mistakes were made, but not by me. Okay. Um, so the, uh, uh, we'll just jump into the reading. Some of you did, now who all did this one again? Okay. What was good about doing this one? Yeah, so there's a lot of examples. Um, it's a, uh, it's clear. It's got subheadings. Subheadings are good, right? It points you to the uh, points you to the main ideas. So what was bad about it? Two yeah, it's really long, right? Yeah, yeah. that would be the. Uh, I was going to do this one, but I ended up doing the nudge because the, the, there wasn't enough in the pinker, and this was too long. Okay, so um, so the central the central concept here is this cognitive dissonance thing. And uh, um, who's the neuroscience guy in here? All right. So uh, uh, because I have a neuroscience guy in here, I've got to cover my neuroscience bases. So I'm sorry to everyone else. But, uh, um, cognitive dissonance, I'm just going to just put it off to the side, is not the right way to think about it. Because what's really happening, what they're describing as cognitive dissonance and cognitive psychology, what's really happening is the uh, interior cingulate cortex activates and creates a, 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 a chain of events that makes you, uh, it responds to uncertainty. It's not dissonance, it's just uncertainty. And then it doesn't shut off until the DLPFC uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex uh, manages to deactivate the anterior cingulate cortex and, 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 and restores what they call cognitive consonance. But that's not really the metaphor for it. So it's uh, uh, so that being said, if you're not going into neuroscience, I'm just going to pretend like cognitive dissonance is a real thing because the effects they're describing are real. It's just, uh, are you satisfied with that? Okay. So I might see you in the I might see you in the fMRI lab, and I don't want you to tell your I don't want you to tell anybody that I'm a jackass that believes in cognitive dissonance. I live in fear of such moments. The mere neuron thing, man. No, no mere neurons. I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, cognitive dissonance, as they describe it here, is the, uh, uh, well, here's the story of where it came from. Would you like me to go over the story, or do you, have, you, have you imbibed it enough that I don't need to go over it? Hmm? Go over it? No? Don't go over it? I'm going over it because I want to, because I like talking about it. <laughs> Executive override. Free community college. I don't care what you vote. All right. I wish that I could get my money back from community college. So this guy, Leon Festinger, and his graduate students deviously infiltrate this doomsday cult. Right? So this, they call her Marion Keach. That wasn't her real name. I used to know it. I don't know what it is. She said that the world's going to end at midnight on day X. And these, these guys were like, you know what? Leon Festinger and his grad students. I don't think the world's actually going to end on midnight on day X. So we're going to join this cult. And we're going to sneak in and see what these bozos do when the world doesn't end. Right? That's kind of mean-spirited. Why make fun of kooks? Let them be kooky. So you had these different, different levels of belief of these believers. Right? Some of them were just, uh, eh, you know... Uh, it's a place to meet people, you know, like, so, yeah, you know, I'll hang out with these guys. Maybe it's good, maybe we'll go off. Because the thing, not only is the world going to end, they're going to be saved by aliens who swoop down in a flying saucer and save them because they're the chosen ones, like Noah, except for without the animals. They're sitting there, praying, getting ready to be taken, because they're the chosen ones. I wish I was the chosen one. Actually, I'm very glad that I'm not. Okay, uh-uh. And then midnight comes. Well, oh, I forgot. Some people quit their jobs, dropped out of school, told their bosses to go f themselves. You know, uh, just just gave away their house, sold. You know, just gave everything away because why not? Right? Here, take my car because even though the world's going to end, I'm not going to be needing it. Well, these people will think good of you as the world blows up. You know, that crumbo, hell of a guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but midnight comes, and they're standing around. Imagine how awkward this is. I looked at the clock. It's midnight. 
nervous glances. So he says, oh, the clock's wrong. That clock says that we still got three minutes. <sighs> I'm going to hear the clock tick. It never does it when I want it to. The clock ticks. Awkward. Awkwardness. Time comes. Nope. It's not going to happen. People without big investments. <coughs> well, if the world's not going to end, I actually am going to need to get to that meeting tomorrow morning. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, next meeting. All right. And the people who, are, who, are, who, who really believe and gave up everything, right? They're crushed, right? They're devastated, right? Wouldn't you be? I would be. I don't have as good of a, a recuperative mechanism for these things. But what happened? All right. You already knew it. What, what happened to the people that gave away everything? They killed themselves? No. They didn't kill themselves. They spun it. And enough time came by, they flipped the whole script on that booty. Flipped it like a pancake. Not only were they not wrong, they were even righter than they knew because by sitting there and praying, the, the fact that the world didn't blow up is proof that they were right. Because they intervened and saved the world. Awesome. <laughs> so everyone, moment of silence for Marion Keach and her devout followers for saving the world with their prayers. So these guys didn't come off all chastened and stuff. They went out and they're like, Argh. all right. And then they were actually just sort of an innocuous group and, and you know, they say, hey, you know, but then they go off beating people over the head and holding signs and, on, on, the, on the, the busy street corners and stuff. And who knows, maybe this is the obscure origins of Brother Dean. I don't know. <laughs> There's probably something along these lines, though. Why would you care what people think that much? That's the only thing that I don't understand. Like, not one of you guys agrees with me, but I don't care. It's all right. All right, anywho. Okay, so that's the cognitive dissonance thing. And the funny thing about cognitive dissonance is that we really don't like it, and it's way easier to, to uh, distort reality <coughs> than it is to, uh, uh, to change ourselves. So, so, you know, when the, the Alcoholic Anonymous mantra, uh, you can only change yourself, you can't change the world, you can't change, you know, what, what is it, the... Um, only the things that cannot change, anyone know this? Um, grant me the serenity, the serenity prayer. The serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. Wisdom to know the difference. So the idea is you can only change yourself. But that's the only thing that you can't change. It's actually easier to distort the whole world and turn the fact that the world didn't end into proof that you were right than it is to actually change your own opinion. Which is interesting. Especially for people that need to write persuasive arguments. Okay. Uh, um, so that's the idea of cognitive dissonance. So then they start going through all of these crazy things that people do to, uh, uh, um, to uh, assuage cognitive dissonance. One of my favorite words, assuage, A-S-S-U-A-G-E. It's on the GRE, if any of you take the GRE. It means to soothe. Assuage. It's sort of soothing. Many S's. Okay. And actually, there's a joke, and I'm trying really hard not to say it, and that's why I'm, that's why that didn't make any sense. But I'm not going to say it. So the other thing that 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 uh, um, so then they go through all these crazy things. So the one is with the frats. Do you guys know about the the frats and the hazing thing, right? So this was this was this was this was fun. Who's in a fraternity? All right. Sororities. Military. Gang. Okay, this will all work different. So uh, um, the, the, the thing is, is that people that have to, that have to uh, uh, go through a very uh, uh, tough initiation, right, uh, put more value on their group membership, right? So um, uh, if, if I pretend that I'm a pledge, or I'm, I'm a would-be pledge, and I'm deciding on whether or not I'm going to, and, and, and uh, um, no, this is going nowhere. I don't want to be a pledge. It's no good. I'm too old for that. Uh -uh. You've, got a, uh, you've got a group of people. You divide them into two. Now you have two groups of people. They're both going to join your frat. These guys have to drink a beer and, uh, and, and say the Pledge of Allegiance in their underwear on top of your frat house. And they're in the frat. No big deal, right? 
this group, this group, every single person in the fraternity is going to whack their bare bottom with a spiked bat. <laughs> a spiked bat. <laughs> and then they're going to get hot sauce poured all over their wounds. They have to jump in a tank full of vinegar. Then um, they get tied up and tickled. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then they uh, uh, they get dunked in a tank and sealed, and for three minutes, and all they have to breathe is a big giant balloon filled with the gaseous emissions of their soon-to-be frat brothers. <laughs> and then <laughs> they have to email a naked picture of themselves to their grandmothers. <laughs> So who's going to like the frat more coming out of this? Yeah, of course. God, you know what I went through to get, to get in this stupid frat? So, uh, um, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this, this brings to bear on, on current controversies, right? Because like, we know that like, hazing's bad, right? So, um, but if hazing actually makes for stronger group cohesion, does that complicate the ethical argument? All right, so let's say this. So for frats. All right, everybody close your eyes. Because I want to do a, 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 blind, a blind test and I don't want to make you guys buy clickers. Who thinks secretly in their deepest of souls that hazing is actually a good thing for fraternities? Excellent. Thank you. All right, you can open your eyes. So, but fraternities are kind of, uh, I mean, it's a good way to, it's a good career move. It's a good thing to do, fun way to spend afternoons, you know, good parties. But, um, but you don't really need that kind of camaraderie. But what if, like, you're on a, um, an NFL team, a sports team, right? Because teamwork is important, right? You're supposed to love your team, right? So, so, uh, so in sports, if it actually does make your team closer together and a closer together team does perform better and, like, your whole – raison d'etre, or raisin to eat, as one student uh, emailed me once, is that you're supposed to win, right? So, and if you're in a, being a closer group, is hazing okay for sports teams? Well, no, right? Because uh, this, we had this last year with the, the, uh, the, the NFL thing, right? The uh, um, uh, incognito and, 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 and bullied, bullied an offensive lineman, and he called his mom and was really hurt, and, and, and incognito's out of the league, and, and, and the other guy was the worthless lineman on the 49ers, which basically destroyed the whole team, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so, but maybe a little bit more. So everybody close your eyes again and tell me who thinks secretly in their deepest heart of hearts that maybe a little bit of hazing on a sports team is a good thing to create camaraderie. Uh, a few more. Okay, thank you. Military. Can't haze in the military anymore, right? And uh, there's a movie about this. Anybody seen this movie? It's uh, Jack Nicholson, You Can't Handle the Truth. Yeah. Okay, so it's about, it's about hazing. And the idea is, but, so this is, th these are the people that like fight and defend, right? You got a couple minutes, you don't need to pack up. These are the guys that fight and defend your country, right? And if they're a more effective fighting unit, if they get some hazing coming in, is that a good thing? Close your eyes. Who's willing to put up with it in the military? Okay. You're in a gang. All right. This guy gets in the gang. He drinks a beer and says the Pledge of Allegiance on the gang leader's house. This guy had to shoot somebody to get in the gang. You're going to be selling drugs, extorting people, running rackets, killing people, all kinds of things. You're in a gang. You are in the game. You are in this game. You know about this cognitive study. Do you want to be in the game with the beer drinker or the killer? Now close your eyes. Who's for hazing in a game? In your game. Okay. That was a lot more. So this would be an, an interesting controversy analysis. Though. So, so this is the kind of thing where, where things were right thinking. No right thinking person. No. So, um. An excellent example of a logos is an appeal. Is this morning, my four-year-old dumped her bowl of Cheerios on my dog. 
And I said, oh, my dear four-year-old, what a dear you are, my little lily of my life, as I call her. Why, pray tell, did you dump a bowl of Cheerios on the dog? <coughs> Watching the wheels spin. She said I was stupid. <laughs> Logic. The dog called her stupid. The dog deserved to get Cheerios dumped on. The dog didn't care. The dog was like, score Cheerios, right? So, uh, I have a, uh, um, so that's a logical argument, right? Okay. These are the appeals. Logos. Okay. And then there's a, 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 um, a pathos or pathos, depending on depending on who's pronouncing it. Oh, all right. That's what's what's pathos. Emotional appeal. So can uh, uh, somebody give me an example of an emotional appeal? Just like something that happened in your life, an anecdote, or a commercial or something that makes a very powerful emotional appeal. And you're like, you know, that's an emotional appeal. Oh, yeah. So like Nike, like just do it? Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's not, it's not logical. Yeah? That Budweiser commercial where they have like a little puppy and then they're growing up with the person <coughs> I've never seen that commercial, but I'm it's devastated. Sad. It's very sad. Like, I'm probably never coming home. You know what? That's it. I'm not drinking and driving anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything with puppies. Puppies are, 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 are the... Uh, uh, they're the, the doomsday machine of emotional appeal, right? Puppies will get you. Yeah. That's why. So who all's new? Okay. You guys missed out on the bonobos. I'm sorry. If you want to know what we did in first class, look at the syllabus and look up bonobos and chimps and the difference. But I'm not going to talk about it in class ever again. I'm sorry. Um, so we had this uh, 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 CTKs. Who didn't finish their CTK? And then the new people, presumably. Okay, so what we're going to do with this is um, uh, because uh, uh, we have we have a substantial, a statistically significant new population of students. The, uh, um, the, the CTK, if you haven't turned it in yet, turn it in by Friday, 11.59 p.m. If after today's discussion, or if you just think that, if you just know that you did a total crap job on it and you want to you uh, um, uh, redo it, uh, you have till Friday to turn in, and I, I won't grade them until Saturday, so you can, so you can, you can do better. It, it will say that it's past due, but you should still be able to, to, to uh, uh, put it in the Dropbox. And delete your old one. Because I get confused, I mentioned I get I'm a little I'm a little batty. I'm I'm getting old, and you this doesn't. I don't have the robust intellectual firepower that you guys do. I get confused easily. Yes, ma'am. Do you have to do one for each, like for all three readings? No. You just have to do one. You just have to do one. You pick you pick you pick one and do it. Oh. So anytime there's a CTK due, that means that uh, um so to to be absolutely crystal clear about this well, I'm not absolutely crystal clear I've mentioned it in passing in class and it wasn't on the assignment so what you'll do when you have a CTK do is all of the readings that aren't okay that was bad cognitive science all the readings from uh, D2L that you've done since the last CTK you choose which one you like the best and you write the CTK on that what you cannot write a CTK on is uh, um, like the, the uh, readings from Writing Public Lives or Student's Guide. Did anybody do a CTK on Writing Public Lives or Student's Guide? Okay, because man, that would have been... Not that there's anything wrong with CTK or <laughs> Writing Public Lives or Student's Guide. Um, you got to look out for them. Okay. Um, and then there's another one. What is it? 
and e e ethos, I think. So what's ethos? Hmm? Yeah, it's the thing that everybody, it's, because it's a trick, because you think ethics, right? But it's, it's got, no, it's, 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 no, it's not. I, I think that we should go back, we should go back, and grab Aristotle by the ear, and say, call ethos something else, because everybody gets it confused with ethics. Because it's not, it's the, but it's the, it's the, I've been yammering at Aristotle for a good 13 years now, and the old kook just, it's like he's not even there. So that, that, that's, that's, that's not it. That's what everybody thinks it is. And when this class is over and somebody asks you, that's what you'll say it is. And if somebody shakes me up in the middle of the night and says, what is ethos? I'm like, I don't know, like morals. But, but it's not. What is it? It's an appeal to authority or authenticity. Like, why should you be listening to this guy? <coughs> right? So, like, uh, um, say you're joining a gang. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this a lot today because I'm just, for some reason, I've got gangs on the brain. And, uh, uh, and you want some advice, right? So you know who I'm going to talk to? Crumbo. <laughs> because, uh, uh, and so I will, uh, uh, I will tell you about uh, um, what you need to do to, uh, uh, and you, you, and your, you and your homies will come, and I will talk to you about the ins and outs of being a successful gang member. So should I be listened to? Would you listen to me? No. no. Because I don't have any, I don't have any crap, right? I, I, um, I don't know. I don't just determine the, uh, the author, speaker, the message, purpose, and the context, audience of uh, whatever it is that you uh, happen to be rhetorically analyzing. Okay. So what's an author, speaker? The person that's writing or like telling Right. Very good. And the message? What they're trying to convey. One might say the message. <laughs> New England. Yay, deflate gate. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I just saw New England. You know, I don't know if, if you guys heard New England's in trouble because they deflated a bunch of balls during a game, which is fun to say. Context audience. What is a context audience? Like who the message is going to? So um, this does seem like it's a, so we've got, so a rhetorical situation is any time when somebody's talking to somebody else, right? So you've got somebody talking, you've got what they're saying, and you've got the person that's listening. Okay, I'm glad that, is, is that clear? So like what's the what's the rhetorical situation right now? Yeah. So who's the speaker? You are. What's my what's my message? Yeah, we understand what you're saying. Kind of. We'll have to work on that, but yeah, the gist is there. And and uh, I'll, who's my audience? Well, okay, I think we got that. All right. Everybody got this? Okay. I'm going to erase it. So if you need to write it down. <laughs> it's also in your book. Okay. And then there's another, there's another like triangle of stuff, right? Maybe it was in the other book. So there's the ethos, the pathos, and the logos, right? <coughs> the different kinds of appeals. Does anybody remember anything about that? I really I can't remember anything. So what was the what was the logos? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll we'll start with the uh, with with a quick discussion of the writing public lives and students guide because that's what the uh, that's what our assignment in the class is about.
right? Okay, so it's, so we, we're doing this rhetorical analysis. But remember, everything's working toward this rhetorical analysis that we've got due coming up. I think like next week we have to basically start on getting our thesis for it and stuff. It's just it's the thing about about only having one day of class for the first two weeks of school. So um, rhetorical situation. This is important, right? Because we're doing a class on on, on rhetoric. So um, what is a rhetorical situation? I think it was in one of the books. I read it. Pull our books out. Absolutely. I like books. Um, okay, right from the book. Can you say that one more time that we've got a little more less 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 bustle? I actually already forgot. Okay. <laughs> Author, speaker, message, purpose, contents, and audience. Okay, so we've got a. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a This corner, behind door number one is a goat. I still can't get my head around that door number two thing about switching your choices after they do it. It increases your, doubles your chance to pick the right door. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so we've got uh, speaker, audience. No, wait, that's wrong. Speaker, author. Right? Author, speaker, yeah. Author, speaker, okay. Okay, so that's one. And what was the other one? Message, purpose. <coughs> Message, purpose. Context. Context. Audience. Okay. So this is important because, because, uh, um, this is, you know, part of your rhetorical analysis is what you're going to have to do.